Thanks for the opportunity to present an economics perspective on the admirable pursuit of an equally healthy future. Now, such a perspective raises two issues. How better to manage the resources we have? And secondly, expanding our view of the resources that could be used to generate health and well-being. With respect to the second point, I mean different kinds of entity, often in the third sector, driven by social missions and with no share ownership, that might have an important role in health improvement. And although not new, many of our ideas are driven by those of 2006 Nobel Peace Laureate Mohammed Yunus, seen here in character for an episode of The Simpsons. Yunus's association with Glasgow Caledonian University goes back to 2008, when he delivered the first Magnuson Lecture established in memoriam to Magnus Magnuson, who died whilst in office as GCU Chancellor. Let's start with the following question. Will health and social care integration avoid the need to manage scarcity of resources, especially in a period of austerity? Despite offering potential to better manage resources across budgetary and service boundaries, I contend that the answer to this question is still no. Needs will still outstrip resources available, thus implying the necessity of choice over what things to do, what not to do, and to even stop doing. This fundamental point is rarely recognised in documents on reform of public services. Here we have statements about reform that could come from virtually any government in any country of the world and feature heavily in our own legislation on integration. It's going to be about balance of care, effectiveness and efficiency, and it's going to be outcomes focused and evidence based. But my question, which is rarely addressed in such legislation, would be, OK, but what's your process for deciding on the resource flows that would come from having a different balance of care, from making decisions about in effectiveness and efficiency and taking outcomes into account? To which your answer might then be, well, we're going to examine how we're using resources and how we can use them differently. Sounds like music to my ears as an economist. The word resources has even been mentioned. And you might then be thinking, why then do we need to bring these bloody health economists over for Glasgow, or not, as in my particular case today, to tell us how to go about this? But I still think we're talking in platitudes here with no indication of, of what is the process for examining and changing our uses of resources. To try to put it in more common language, what, is, what this requires is an economics approach to needs assessment if we're trying to best match resources to needs then we can ask five questions about resource use in any particular context what resources do we have available in total and how are those resources currently deployed as indicated by one and two on this slide number three asks what would we like to do more of and why and what would that cost but if operating within a fixed funding envelope we have to ask the questions portrayed there under numbers four and five, which are about trying to provide the same service at less cost, or scaling back some services because we think there is actually a more beneficial use of those resources. That's often referred to in the jargon as programme budgeting and marginal analysis. These questions can be applied at any level of a system where we feel scarcity is biting. And by way of infusion, we're working with three pilot health and social care partnership sites in Scotland on how to integrate these questions into their management systems in the area of reshaping care for older people. In doing this, we're drawing on lessons of using programme budgeting and marginal analysis in now over 150 health organisations worldwide and documented in this book. This means having a health economist work closely with a group of decision makers and addressing, for example, what do current resource management processes look like? What are the information needs and what will we do in the absence of information? Against what criteria will we assess and score and rank options? Who's involved? These are the key aspects of process I was going on about at the start, but which we need to address to ensure a better balance of care. That is, that it's less out of kilter. In all of this, a key question is what is the evidence on the third sector contribution? And I just wanted to mention that we have embarked on a project funded by the Glasgow Council for the Voluntary Sector to gather the formal global literature on the impact of the third sector 
across eight key areas of reshaping care for older people. I just want now to return to my initial point about thinking differently about health creation. This is the difference in life expectancy between best and worst off in the city of Glasgow. And one of the great modern conundrums is that this gap has grown alongside a world-class NHS and world-class public health initiatives. The experts that have produced such data, like Sir Michael Marmot at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, have long recognised the need to move upstream to tackle the causes of the causes of such differences in health and well-being. If it's hopelessness, lack of connectedness that kills people, then might there not be a role for social enterprise, any social enterprise, in remedying this? When I say any social enterprise, what I mean is that they do not have to mention health in their mission or even trade in health services or health products. By acting on aspects of social vulnerability, any social enterprise could claim to be acting on upstream determinants of health. This fits well with an assets-based approach as espoused by our last Chief Medical Officer, Sir Harry Burns, and we're actually pursuing this agenda in a £1.96 million research programme funded by the Medical Research Council in collaboration with the sector and five other universities across Scotland. So in sum, I'm really saying two things, that we need to better manage our publicly funded resources and we have processes to aid us in doing that, but also if we can evidence the role of social enterprise in the third sector as public health initiatives, then we can expand our view of which resources to manage for better and fairer health.